My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's video is entitled COVID-19, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine and risks to the heart. As we find ourselves in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're beginning to realize that this particular virus is far more dangerous than we had initially thought. And apart from largely supportive measures, we don't really have any proven effective treatment so far. The truth is that while social distancing and the lockdown will uh, control the spread of the illness, it doesn't impact on the dangerousness of the illness, meaning that if you are unlucky enough to catch it, then um, you, know, you could easily suffer the severe form of the illness and that can be very dangerous. It is therefore unlikely that the most vulnerable uh, people in society will actually be safe unless there was an effective treatment or a vaccine available and a vaccine may take a while to become available if ever and therefore people are desperately looking for anything which offers an effective treatment for this condition. Now for any treatment to be a good treatment it should have three qualities. It should be effective, um, it should not cause any harm and it has to have a reliable evidence base supporting its use, and that evidence should come from large-scale, well-designed clinical trials. More recently, there have been some reports of chloroquine and, hydro and hydroxychloroquine uh, offering some protection against the virus. And this has led to some world authorities, including President Trump in the US, declaring that this could be a game changer. Uh, why? Because it's already widely used in certain populations. Uh, you know, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are widely used. And in general, they're considered generally safe. So the theory is, well, it's we know it's OK. Uh, what's the harm in trying it? The problem with this statement is that um, what may appear safe in a small number of patients may not be safe when given en masse to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, the reality is that whilst many people will get COVID-19, only a relatively small proportion of them will suffer a really severe course of the illness. And the truth is that if you have a treatment like this, you're going to be giving it to everyone and therefore you may be giving up, you'll, you'll probably be giving it to far more people than the people who are likely to develop the severe form of the illness. And therefore, you may be giving these medications to more people who don't absolutely need them. And therefore, it is feasible that if in any way the drug weren't a safe drug or had side effects, just by virtue of the fact that you were giving it to so many people, some people may end up being harmed uh, and they may not have ever had the severe form of the virus anyway. So in this blog, I was very keen to review the evidence regarding the possible benefits of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and also possibly harm that could result from injudicious prescribing. At present, there is just not enough evidence to guide us either way. However, there are around about 100 uh, trials of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, both on their own or in combination with other medications that are being performed all over the world. And hopefully we will have more results and we will know better. But at this point in time, I'm just going to share with you what I have found. OK, so the first thing to say is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine belong to a class of medication known as four amino quinolones. They're most widely used in um, malaria, they're used in rheumatoid arthritis, and they're used in lupus or SLE. They have some properties which may theoretically make them effective antiviral agents. Many viruses need an acidic environment to replicate. Four aminoquinolones, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, are weakly alkaline, so they increase the pH in the cells of the host and thereby theoretically they may reduce the likelihood of the virus replicating because they can inactivate some of the enzymes that the virus needs to replicate. In particular with regards to the COVID-19 virus what we know is that the COVID-19 virus needs a receptor called the ACE2 receptor to get into the body and there is some evidence that um, four aminoquinolones also have an impact on this receptor and that's why it makes it particularly attractive to think well could these offer some kind of hope or some kind of effective treatment for this condition unfortunately however when people have tested out these agents in cell cultures and animal studies their antiviral effects have been variable 
Um, four aminoquinolones have been used in a lot of viruses, okay? They've been pitted against many viruses. So they were used in Epstein-Barr virus or infectious mononucleosis. In these cells, what they found was in pa patients who had, in cells which were infected with EBV, chloroquine actually increased viral replication. It was used, they were used in Zika virus. In one study, chloroquine reduced the transmission of the virus, but the study was in infected mice, so five infected mice, and it reduced the transmission to the children, to the offspring of the mice. Uh, it's been tried out in Ebola and chloroquine um, reduced Ebola replication in vitro, but when you perform the studies in animals, uh, it caused worsening in guinea pigs and it had no real effect in hamsters and mice. Made no difference to mortality. So when we then start saying, okay, well, that's lab, but we need to obviously try it out in humans as well to see whether it makes any difference. Uh, it's been tried in dengue fever, and they found that chloroquine inhibited dengue fever in the lab, but then they tried it in a study of 37 patients, and it did not shorten the duration of the illness in dengue fever. So now, where does COVID-19 fit into all this? Well, there was a paper by a Chinese group, uh, the lead author is Yao, Y-A-O, who suggested that in vitro, when you use hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, it could inhibit the SARS um, coronavirus 2, which is the COVID virus. And they found that hydroxychloroquine was better at doing that compared to chloroquine. This was only published in March. Uh, and this was the trigger that led to small scale studies being done in human patients because people are so desperate. They saw this, they said, oh, maybe it works because we see it works in vitro. Let's try it in humans. So I'll just talk to you about what studies are out there. All right. Um, one was by uh, a group uh, in China. Uh, the lead author was Chen. And here they took 62 patients uh, who had been admitted with COVID-19 to hospital. 31 patients were given hydroxychloroquine at a dose of 400 milligrams for five days. Uh, the other group was just ma uh, managed supportively. And what the authors were measuring was the time to recovery the average, uh, the time to recovery, they wanted to know uh, how quickly their body temperature, because coronavirus causes high temperatures, how long, how quickly the body temperature comes down, and also how quickly does the cough improve with coronavirus when you give patients hydroxychloroquine compared to nothing. And what they found was that uh, indeed those people who took the hydroxychloroquine Firstly, the average age of that group was 44 years, 44.7 years. So generally a healthy population, not generally the kind of population that severe that suffer a very severe form of illness. But what they found was that the time to recover, the body temperature and the time for cough uh, was notably shorter in the hydroxychloroquine group. It was also worth noting that in the placebo group, four people developed much more severe illness, uh, but this did not happen in the hydroxychloroquine group. There were also two patients in the hydroxychloroquine group who developed some side effects, minor side effects, uh, but we didn't see that obviously in the group that wasn't taking the hydroxychloroquine. So again, some encouraging data, but a very small study. There was another study that was done as a consequence. This was by a French group, and this is the controversial study that actually persuaded a lot of kind of that, that President Trump looked at and was convinced by, uh, but this was a um, this was a study performed by a group um, in France. Uh, the lead author was Didier Raoult, and here what they did was they took 42 patients with COVID-19. Their average age was about 45 years. Again, a healthy group of people. They gave 26 of them 600 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine daily, and then 16 of those patients were controls. Okay. In some patients who were on the hydroxychloroquine arm, they also gave another antibiotic called azithromycin. And I think they gave six of those patients azithromycin in addition to the hydroxychloroquine. And what the authors were interested in is how long does it take to clear the virus on swabs? So they measured the viral load in um, a nasopharyngeal swab, um, and then they kept an eye on that until the end of day six of the study to see which group cleared the virus quicker. And what they found was that at the end of day six, 70% of patients in the hydroxychloroquine group um, tested negative for the virus, but only 12.5% in the control arm 
um, <laughs> tested negative. So significantly higher number of people in a very small population uh, tested negative when they were taking hydroxychloroquine at the end of day six. They also said that in those people who were taking both azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, all patients uh, had completely cleared the virus at the end of day six. So they were very sort of bullish about this, very excited, you know, and um, it initially sounded very promising until you looked a little bit further. And I think that is the crucial bit of information that hasn't come out. Um, when you look at the data further, what you find is, yes, 26 patients were given hydroxychloroquine, but the final data in the paper were only presented for 20 patients. So you have to ask what happened to those six patients that were given the hydroxychloroquine, but you're not telling us anything about what happened to them. And the reason these six patients were excluded from the analysis was because they didn't complete day six. OK, they didn't go. They didn't remain in the study for the full six days. The question is why? Well, one of them died. Two had to be moved to the intensive care unit and two patients withdrew. So in those patients who were given the chloroquine, six, you know, two patients had to be moved to intensive care and one had actually died, whereas we didn't see this in the control arm. But they didn't declare that when they were publishing the results of the study. They didn't really focus on that. Um, in addition, it's also worth knowing that the patient who died had tested negative for the coronavirus. So again, you know, he had the coronavirus because he tested positive initially, but at the time of death, the, there was no coronavirus. So it's really important to understand is that when we're looking for treatments, we are looking for treatments that prevent death. We are looking for treatments that prevent clinical outcomes. You know, the clearing of the swab, clearing of the virus from the swab is a surrogate endpoint. And it clearly seems that at least on the basis of this data, you cannot be relying, you cannot rely on the fact that just because you've cleared the virus, something you're not going to come to harm. The one person who did die in the whole study had cleared the virus on the swab and still died. So again, you know, when you look at this, the data really are very, very, um, you know, are, are not at all um, uh, convincing. And in some ways, you could say that, you know, they haven't really been totally upfront about the results and people have jumped to conclusions and what they should have been doing, these authors should have been a little bit more honest about exactly what happened. Because what they found really is if they included those six patients, you would get no real benefit because in the group with the hydroxychloroquine, one person died. In the control group, no one died. In the, in the group with the hydroxychloroquine, two people went to intensive care none um, none went to the intensive care in the placebo arm and uh, you know uh, so all they've managed to show is yes you clear the virus but the more important thing is does it stop bad things happening and this research did not suggest that it stopped bad things happening in any case it was on the basis of these flawed trials that the interest uh, that the interest in these medications as a potential uh, treatment really took off um, we clearly need better, larger, well-designed, honest studies to inform us. The more important question is, OK, well, this is the benefits are purported on these very small, limited studies. What about harm? What do we know about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine? Can these medications cause harm in some way? So in general, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are considered to be safe. And in general, side effects are generally mild and transient. However, what is really important to understand is that the margin between a therapeutic dose and a toxic dose is very narrow. So people can develop toxicity if they take too much, if they've got problems breaking it down, if, if the medications are interacting with other medications that keep the medications in the body for longer. Chloroquine poisoning, which is not uh, unheard of, which is relatively, um, you know, which has been reported many times, can be associated with major cardiac problems, which can be life-threatening. In patients who use these agents over several years, the most recognized complication is retinopathy or eye retinal toxicity, damage to the back of the eyes to the retina. But we also see cardiotoxicity and neuromyotoxicity, nerves and muscle, toxicity of the nerves and muscles. 
With regards to the heart, what we see is that long-term usage of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine can cause cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy meaning weakness of the heart muscle. So they can cause a dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart can enlarge and become weak. And they can also cause something called a restrictive cardiomyopathy in which the heart becomes stiff. And the problem with this is that this interferes with the heart being able to function effectively as a pump. And in turn, this can be dangerous. There was a small study uh, by a group of French authors that looked at 25 patients who had developed chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine related cardiomyopathy. And they found that half, almost half of these 25 patients actually died after developing the cardiomyopathy. In the majority of the rest, if you took the medications away, there was maybe some partial improvement or no further deterioration. But some of these patients actually required heart, required heart transplantation. So clearly a worry. Uh, we also see that long-term use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can cause heart rhythm disturbances. They can cause heart block. They can cause bundle branch block. Um, and what we find is that we see this more often in patients who are predominantly women, people who've had more than 10 years of treatment, who have pre-existing heart disease and kidney disease, um, and, those are the, and older patients. And those are the people who seem to be particularly vulnerable to the side effects of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. But you know, the reality is this is 10 years of use. This is a lot, this is chronic use. What about acute use? Because in COVID-19, the likelihood is that people will only be taking these medications for only a short amount of time. Uh, so perhaps some of these side effects wouldn't be such a big deal. Uh, we do know, however, that even in the short term, these agents can prolong something called the QT interval on the ECG. They can interfere with the electricity and the way the electricity and the heart muscle cells respond to electricity. And in some patients, this can translate into heart rhythm disturbances and even sudden death. Okay, the usual QTC is 440 milliseconds in men and 460 milliseconds in women. When the QTC goes above 500 milliseconds, we tend to worry as cardiologists because we worry that the patient is predisposed to dangerous heart rhythm disturbances. If you take something that increases the QT interval, combine it with another agent that you, it also increases the QT interval, the risks are magnified, right? The likelihood of the QT going up is even greater. Now, what is really interesting is, of course, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine prolong the QT interval, but so does azithromycin, the antibiotic that the French group used in combination. And this is the treatment they, they had recommended. So azithromycin increases the QT interval and chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine increase the um, QT interval. And there was some uh, interesting research that hasn't been peer reviewed, but it is available on the net by Chorin, Chorin et al., and they measured the QT interval in 84 patients um, who were given this hydroxychloroquine azithromycin combination. Uh, and so they measured the QT interval. And what they found was that the QTC increased by 40 milliseconds in about 30% of patients. 40 milliseconds is a lot. So imagine if, you're, if your QTC, your normal QTC is 460 as a woman, suddenly you take something and there's a one in a three chance that your QTC could go up by 40 milliseconds, taking you up to the 500 millisecond mark, which is obviously a, quite a dangerous uh, level to be at. So, and they found that in 11% of patients, the QTC went up to 500 milliseconds. Um, so that was clearly a concern. And obviously if, uh, you know, before people rush out and start buying these medications, it's really important that before you do that, someone should be keeping a very close watch on you, keeping a close watch on your ECG. And really at this point in time, the data isn't really particularly strong for their benefit anyway. Um, also, it's important to know that there are lots of other medications that also increase the QTC interval. So people can um, be on anti-psychiatric medications. And if for any reason you take a combination of azithromycin and chloroquine, then your QTC could go up even higher. So these are not medications to be taken, um, you know, willy nilly. They need uh, medical supervision. They need ECG monitoring, etc. And this is the major concern among scientists that actually, you know, turning out and saying, oh, well, look, you know, this could be a game changer. 
maybe a little bit of a premature declaration and the worry obviously is people just try and get their hands on chloroquine etc and they don't really quite understand what the risks are of taking it and whether their other medications could interact with it in any way. So we need to still um, wait and see what the research shows uh, but uh, at this point in time, I don't think anyone can really wholeheartedly recommend something like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine uh, for patients uh, to be taken en masse. Uh, sure, they can be used in a hospital setting under very careful supervision by someone who has a lot of experience, but otherwise, at this point in time, the data are really lacking. So I hope uh, you found this useful. Um, I know, I know everyone's sort of desperate for some kind of treatment, something to give them hope that if they catch the virus, uh, then there's something that can help. And the reality is supportive care helps, oxygen helps. And of course, trying to prevent yourself from getting the virus is important, is hugely important. So all the kind of hand washing, social distancing rules are really, really important. In any case, I hope you found this useful. I'd be so interested in hearing your thoughts. And thank you once again for all that you do for me. All the best. Bye.